at Psalm 146. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy Lord. Oh, holy word. Well, let, let me ask you something. Did you know, did you really know in this country that we're getting ready for a presidential election? I mean, have you heard about this? I mean, of course you've heard about it. Some of you are saying it's all you've heard about for the past three months. In fact, some of you are so annoyed by it, you wish you could go back to just 24-7 coverage of how awful the coronavirus is. Uh, we're, we're tired of hearing about the election. But while the election is the last thing some of us want to be hearing about right now, we cannot deny that the election and the accompanying hubbub around it is just playing such a, a huge part in our lives right now. I mean, it's estimated, get this, it's estimated that $11 billion, billion with a B, $11 billion will be spent this election season on advertising for the election. So everywhere you turn, you see or hear an ad for the election or a news story about the election. You can't get away from it. And just because of that, there are just so many people, I see, who just get swept up in the mania of it all. And so it becomes what we think about. It becomes what we talk about. It becomes what we're passionate about. People have strong opinions about it, and we have strong opinions about it. And so for that reason, just because it's everywhere and it's such a big part of our lives, we must consider how we approach it as followers of Jesus. I mean, because, as I said, it's way too easy to get caught up in the mania of it all. We can get caught up in our political perspectives, our, our political candidates and our political parties and our political agendas, and we can forget that it is not the political kingdom or any earthly kingdom that we hold first allegiance to. Our first allegiance is to the kingdom of God. But all this election business, it can cause us to forget that, can it? Case in point, one influential Christian voice, uh, who until recently was the president of the largest Christian university in the country, he stated there is nothing that the president could do that could cause him to lose his support. Wow. Now, whether or not you agree with his zeal for the current president, it's not the point. The point is that Christian leader allowed his zeal for a political perspective to kind of lead him astray it it lead him into following a mere person and where that person leads, no matter where they lead, instead of following after God. Take a look at this quote by Pastor Mike Slaughter. I I think it makes a good point. Uh, Mike Slaughter says, many Christians today have confused the gospel of the kingdom with the politics of the nation state and have embraced worldly political leaders as ultimate heralds of truth. He, he says we embrace political leaders as heralds of truth, which means we kind of embrace them as God. This rings true. Many American Christians have fallen into this trap this election season. That's why you have Christians saying, you know, so-and-so is God's candidate. A vote for them is a vote for God. Or you can't be a Christian and vote for so-and-so. If you're a Christian, you have to vote for this other guy. And the disturbing, confusing thing is that we have pools of Christians saying these things about both main candidates for president. They'll pick a candidate, presumably because they like his stance or one or two issues that are important to them. And then they'll just overlook everything else regardless of how poor policy other things would be for the United States or how, how contrary to godly character things might be, they, they just overlook it because, you know, they define that candidate being good by these one or two issues. Or more disturbingly, this is what I see, and it just disturbs me greatly, they rewrite their own morality and values to conform to the candidate's platform and attitude. 
And so they, they look to the candidate to tell them what's right and what's wrong, and they just agree with it. They become passionate about defending that new morality and that value system, even though in parts it may fly in the face of what God desires for us in this earth. See, when we put our political leaders in that space of God in our lives, that happens. You see, unfortunately, a lot of American Christians do not realize that politicians have become their gods. Politics has become their god. They have become idolaters. Perhaps that's why the Word of God warns us early and on about this, to restrain ourselves from idolizing our political leaders. Uh, take a look again at Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, where it says, Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On the very day, their plans come to nothing. See, we are told not to trust princes, not to look to, to government or political leaders or governing authorities uh, to save us. Now, now, the idea is not that we don't trust them to govern us or we don't submit ourselves to their leadership. That's not what's saying. The Bible is very clear that we are, in most cases, to do just that. But when it says not to put our trust in princes and the political and governing authorities, it means we are not to put our trust in them for ultimate salvation. We are not to put our trust in them to, to reveal to us the ultimate truth of life. We are not to trust in them for prote our ultimate protection or provision. We are not to trust in them to tell us and, and define for us what is right and wrong. The context of the psalm makes it clear that we are to look to God and God alone for that. When it declares, verse 5, Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And it says, He is faithful forever. You see, because these political leaders, these princes, as the psalm would refer to them, because they're mere human beings, they're flawed. I mean, the, the psalm outright tells us they cannot save us. And it goes on to indicate that they are mere humans who can make plans, but next to God, they're powerless to bring those plans to fruition. I mean, do you realize that? Uh, that that whoever our president is, is really in God's eyes, is just powerless? I know in the United States, we don't like to think of our president as powerless, but next to God, he is. You would never know that, though, based on, on the promises the candidates make during their political speeches and during their debates, all these wonderful things they just know they're going to come in and do for this nation. Next to God, they're powerless. And as such, they cannot save us. Again, you would never suspect that to hear some Christians talk. You would think that, that, that politicians are God's plan for salvation for the world. We say, we have to get so-and-so elected because if it's the other guy, that's it for America. Uh, our Christianity is done, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Our governing leaders are given to us by God to carry out God's good purposes, even still, that does not mean that our political leaders are infallible. It doesn't mean they never mess up. You see, they are not gods as we sometimes try to build them up to be. God himself warns us early on in the Old Testament of the potential downsides of our governing authorities. You see, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they come and say, hey, we want a king just like all the other nations even though God was supposed to be their king. So, so God uh, warns them through the prophet Samuel, hey, hey, this isn't going to go great. There are pitfalls of having a governing leader over you like this. But God says, all right, Samuel, go ahead and anoint a king. So Samuel acknowledged, hey, 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 you're going to get a king. But then he, before, as he's doing it, he says, here's a great big list. First Samuel chapter eight, here's a list uh, of things the king's going to do that, that Samuel knows the people aren't going to like. And he says, he's going to do it. And he ends with, he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants, uh, the best of your cattle and donkeys. He will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. The short translation of all that is the king, this political leader, will be flawed, a flawed human who will take from you. Don't put your ultimate trust in him. He cannot save you. 
see our princes, whether elected as we do in the United States or otherwise, they're mere humans, meaning they're flawed. Now we know God establishes them in their authority to, and blesses their leadership uh, so that they, they can bless the people. And he, God blesses them in that when what they are doing is aligned with what God desires for this earth. But they're going to mess up. Let me tell you, they're flawed humans. Every single one of them, every single one of them is going to mess up. Whether just sometimes or all the times, they're going to get some things wrong. They are going to, at times, work against God's desire for this world. And when they do, we need to acknowledge that. We shouldn't just give them a pass and look the other way because, well, we like some other things they're doing. We shouldn't do that because God doesn't do that. We see this in the Old Testament. You know, Israel comes and wants a king, so, so God tells Samuel, go anoint Saul as king. And so Saul becomes the first king of Israel. And for a while, Saul's a, a good king. He's kind of a great king. But after a while, he becomes wicked and self-serving. And when that happened, God just didn't slough it off. He didn't just overlook it because, oh, Saul's doing right and all right in some other things. And he, he was right before, so we'll just kind of overlook it. No, God outright rejects Saul as king. See, God didn't even let King David rest in his laurels. You know, King David, Saul's successor, he was known as the man after God's own heart. I mean, David sought God in everything and worshiped God and, and brought the people to worship God. And so God blessed him. Under David's leadership, Israel rose to prominence, both politically and spiritually. High point for the people of Israel. But then, you know the story, most of you. One evening, David's out on the roof of his palace, and he spies Bathsheba, a married woman, bathing on the roof next door. And so he sends for her, and he has an affair with her. And then when Bathsheba is secretly found to be carrying David's child, David schemes to first dishonor Bathsheba's husband, and then to outright kill him and murder him, so that he can hurry up and marry Bathsheba and cover the whole thing up. But God saw it all. And God didn't just give David a, a pass on that little indiscretion just because he was such a great guy in other ways. No, God instead held David accountable for his misdeeds. He was accountable so that there were immediate consequences. The death of David and Bathsheba's son, the, the baby brought forth out of this affair, he, he, he dies. And he, even though after that God reaffirms his choice for David to remain on the throne... There are consequences of David's actions the whole way through the rest of his reign until he is dead. God didn't just give him a buy on it and, and just accept it and move on just because David did certain other things right. We should do likewise. Rather than just making our leaders our gods and saying, oh, well, they must be right, we must likewise hold our leaders to accountability. The ones we don't like and even the ones we do, which is where we often fall short on, they are not gods. They are mere humans. I mean, they are not perfect. They are flawed. And we must acknowledge that. You see, if we are mature followers of Jesus, we will not just go along with everything our favorite political leaders or parties do and say. We will not be swayed by them just because, hey, we like them in other ways. I mean, the scriptures tell us that as we mature in faith, look at Ephesians 4.14, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. See, as we mature in faith, we grow in our discernment. We know right and wrong. Uh, we're not just carried along by what other people say by cunning and crafty arguments or sometimes even deceitful scheming of politicians. But instead, we learn to approach everything and everyone with the mind of Christ. Sadly, many American Christians too often fall short on this, merely allowing themselves to be carried along by their chosen political party. If the political party says this is how it should be done, well, that must be right. As an example, I give you the issue of life. 
Now, I think it says a lot about our culture uh, by the fact that life has to become a political issue anyway, but it is. And believe it or not, this issue of life as God sees it is not one that is cornered by any uh, of the main political parties. And therefore, it's not cornered by either of the main, main presidential candidates. Because when we talk about life, uh, the issue of life in the church, often we are talking and speaking about the issue of abortion. Now, abortion, let me tell you, it is incompatible with Christian teaching. Psalm 139 uh, makes it clear that life begins in the womb. It's a living person there where God himself knits life together there. In Jeremiah chapter 1, God declares that he knows us even before we're formed there. So these are living beings. So biblically speaking, abortion on demand is murder. And God is very clear about how he feels about murder, right? I mean, do not murder, one of the top 10. So often as Christians, we side with a particular political party and therefore a particular candidate that declares abortion to be wrong and will seek to make laws accordingly. I know that's one of the things I look at heavily during election season. But according to God, abortion is not the only aspect of this life issue we are to be concerned about. We are to be as equally concerned about life and the rights of people after they are born as before. I mean, that's why we read in Isaiah chapter 117, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Deuteronomy 10, 19, God says, you are to love those who are foreigners and take care of them. See, we are to carry out justice uh, by helping people in their life by helping the oppressed and caring for their needs, caring for the needs of the orphan, maybe children in single parent households, caring for widows, immigrants, and people who don't even live in the United States. It's a biblical mandate from God. Unfortunately, it's a mandate that many in the church feel we can just overlook, but it's every bit as important to God as abortion. This is why Sister Joan Chittister, she's a Catholic nun, I don't agree with everything she says, but she said this, I'm opposed to abortion. I do not believe that just because you are opposed to abortion, that makes you pro-life. In fact, I think in many cases, your morality is deeply lacking if all you want is a child born, but not a child fed, a child educated, a child housed. And all of us would say, oh, we're for those things. But so often, our politics don't line up with that. I mean, the frustrating and sad thing is that our political parties and their candidates often split this issue, don't they? I mean, the party that is against so often killing babies isn't so keen to put government or public money toward helping the poor or at-risk kids or immigrants. And the party and candidates that are for helping the poor and the oppressed, well, they fight tooth and nail to keep abortion legal. See, our leading political parties in this nation are fallen. Right? Like they're flawed, right? So they split this pro-life cause that God calls all his people to. And so rather than actually being for life, for, for all life, what do we do? Well, we split it too. And we go one way or the other. We, we pick one side of it. We go with the political party that supports that side. And so we tear down all the others fighting for the same issue on the different side. Because we care more about the health of the political party we have chosen than for actual life. That's one of the reasons I think God warns us not to trust princes, not to put our trust in politicians and their parties for truth, right? Not to just go along with it, what they say and assume that that is the right side to be on. So, what do we do? How do we get through this? Well, I think a good place to start is to remember what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 5, where he says, you are the light of the world. A, a, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. A familiar verse to many of us, to be sure, but did you know it, it, apply, it was talking about politics? It is. It's not solely about politics, but it applies. 
We are not to keep the light of Christ hidden. We are not to keep the truth of Christ and what he says is true hidden, but we are to take it and shine it into all these issues we talk about during the presidential election season. We must seek the scriptures to know Christ's truth, to know his perspective on all these issues, not just assume our political party gets it right. And then we are to shine that light, to shine that truth, to shine that perspective on those issues. When it's politically advantageous, and even when it is not, we are not to be blown about by the teaching and craftiness and politicians. Instead, we, we are to be rooted in Christ. We are to seek his truth, uh, the light of his truth, and then we are to shine that light, shine that truth everywhere. It's not easy. It's not easy to not get caught up in the election mania and just go along with what the party says, but we resist, we must resist if we're to be those who bear and shine the light of Christ. Here's the truth. God, he's not concerned about who's going to win the presidential election in November. He's not concerned uh, about which party gets control of the House or which party gets control of the Senate or who's in control of all of Congress in November. God's not concerned because he's already got all that planned out and he's been at work and he is at work uh, carrying it out, making sure it ultimately comes out to carry out his ultimate good purposes. God's got it covered, so God's not worried about it at all. So I asked this kid, you shouldn't be either. What you should be concerned about is shedding Christ's light on, and, and his truth on all those places, on all those issues and policies within this election that fall short of what God desires because both parties have them. See, as God's child, it's your job to bring the truth, the light uh, of Christ to all those dark places because if we as followers of Jesus don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. If we just ignore these things, no one's going to call them out. And because all political candidates are fallen humans, well, they all have those dark places that need to be exposed to the light of Christ. And because all political parties are composed of fallen humans, they all have those dark places that need to be exposed to the light, the truth of Christ. It's your job to do that. Not to just give them a buy or a pass or to look the other way sometimes because they get some other things right that you like. See, it's good that they get some things right. Celebrate those things. But don't overlook the dark things or the wrong things just because they are politically inconvenient for you to acknowledge. Don't sell out your values in exchange for the good things by overlooking the dark or the wrong things. But shine the light of Christ. Shine the truth of Christ on it all. See, I bring this message today just because I, I, the church... Has, has just missed the boat on this. We, we have failed this. I am so exhausted by the church in America failing to live for Christ and instead living to bolster political parties, political candidates, political ideologies. We ignore the full counsel of Scripture and instead we pick and choose which character issues or what other issues we're going to emphasize and we pick and choose which ones we're just going to overlook, we're going to ignore. We allow ourselves to be tossed back and forth by the cunning craftiness of political pundits and their deceitful scheming. We show an immaturity in our faith and in our relationship with Christ. And we trample the glory of Christ and we pimp it out. We prostitute it to whatever political side we have opted to back. We do exactly as God warns us not to do. We put our trust in princes in our political leaders who are mere humans, flawed humans who cannot save us. Harsh words I know, but I wish all pastors would be preaching them. See, the church in America needs to repent. It starts with us. We need to repent and seek the word of God to determine what our values are, not what some political party says they are. See, here's the thing. God doesn't call you to be a Republican. He doesn't call you to be a Democrat. He calls you above everything else to be his child in his kingdom. He calls you to love the orphan and the widow and the foreigners all life in all places at all times. And he calls you to shine Christ's truth and light 
on all those places, political or otherwise, where that is not happening. We can disagree, especially during election season, on the best ways to protect life or to approach some of these other issues. But we must make sure that whatever our own take on the individual issue is, it's informed and molded by the, the truth, the light of Christ in our own lives. See, whenever you find yourself getting angry or frustrated by any political topic, ask yourself honestly, is my response to this rooted in the light of Christ? Fully am I allowing Christ's light to shine fully on all sides of this topic, not just partially or in a one-sided way, but fully from all angles? Or is the light of Christ being overshadowed in me by my devotion to or my zeal for a political or philosophical ideology outside of Christ? Is this politician I normally like actually leading according to what Christ's truth is in this particular issue? Or do I need, even though I like him, to hold him or her accountable by shining the light of Christ into this place where it's not, not going the way Christ would want it to? On the other hand, is this politician I normally dislike actually speaking according to the truth and the light and love of Christ on this specific topic? If so, even though I normally don't like them, I need to commend them on that. Here's the news. Donald Trump is a flawed, fallen human being. And as such, as difficult is, as it is for some to admit and see, he gets some things right. Let's celebrate those things. But he gets some things wrong. Your job is to shine the light of Christ on those things and bring them into the light, not to overlook them. Here's further news. Joe Biden is a flawed, fallen human being. And as such, as difficult it is for some to see and to acknowledge, he gets some things right. Let's celebrate those things. But he gets some things wrong. Your job is to shine the light of Christ on those things and bring them into light, not just overlook them. People, my goal here today is not to tell you how to vote in several weeks. In, in fact, my words here may have made that a more confusing thing for you as you start to consider, are you looking at things from all angles of, about everything that Christ says? Because none of our candidates is perfect. Whoever you vote for, you are voting for a flawed human being who even if you dislike them, they're going to get some things right, so you need to, to commend them for it. And even if you really like them, they're going to get some things wrong. And in that place, you need to acknowledge that and you need to hold them accountable. Don't just entrust yourself to any of them. Whoever you vote for, do not put your trust in princes, in earthly leaders, in human beings who cannot save us. Instead, look to what Psalm 146 declares in its closing verse. The Lord reigns forever, your God for all generations. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for loving us. We, we thank you for uh, giving us patience and calm during the storm, this turmoil uh, we encounter during this election season. God, we thank you for giving us political leaders and many whom are, are, are godly and, and we thank you for uh, using them to bring about good things. And we thank you uh, for uh, giving us the freedom to have a voice in that God. And God, uh, we pray for our political leaders, uh, acknowledging that every single one of them sometimes gets some things wrong. So help them in that. Help them to seek you, God, and to get it right according to you, not according to what everyone else says, but according to you. God, help us to be calm. Help us to be patient. Help us to have the eyes of Christ and the mind of Christ as we approach this election. God, that we wouldn't be just carried away by the dogma and in the teaching, uh, the, the words of political candidates or parties, but, but we would fully look in everything they are doing. And God, where we need to, we would celebrate uh, when they are your servant. And God, help us to hold them accountable in those times when they are not with you. And give, give us bonus, give us wisdom in that. We pray it all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.